The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. Well, we're in the uh, third week of our series called Life Apps, so we're going through the Ten Commandments one at a time. And uh, I know you guys just sat down, and we've done a lot of standing and sitting. But uh, the very first week we did this, we said we're going to stand every single week with the reading of God's Word. So would you please stand? And if you want, you can keep standing through the whole sermon if you want, all right? <clears throat> and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And this is the command for this week. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You may be seated. I can summarize for you the third commandment in just one sentence. God says, take my name seriously. Take my name seriously. What's in a name? There's a book that a guy named Paul Dickinson wrote and he called it Names. And it's a collection of interesting names that he had collected over the years. He developed this hobby, hobby of collecting interesting and, and, and funny names over the years. He writes about in 1941, there were two men who were executed in the electric chair in the Florida State Penitentiary. And their names were Will Byrne and Frizzle. A little prophetic there. Recently, there was a Montreal widow washer who died by accident falling as he was washing windows, his name was Will Drop. Others, he says, seemed destined for certain occupations. Joe Bunt became a what? Baseball coach. Dan Druff became a barber. Go forth and catch him, two guys became police officers and partners. O'Neill and Prey became partners in church equipment. Zoltan Overy, a gynecologist. P.P. Peters, a urologist, and then a plaster contractor will crumble. Now, what's in a name? You kind of laugh about different names. Uh, But God says, when you're dealing with my name, there's a lot that goes in my name. And you might wonder, why is God so sensitive about his name anyway? Well, a name represents three things. Number one, a name represents your reputation. A name represents your reputation, doesn't it? You say, well, he's got a good name or he's made a name for himself or he's got a bad name. You know, I'd be willing to bet if I name certain things, companies, people, automatically you you think of certain things. If I name Starbucks, you may think of good coffee. You may think of expensive coffee. If I name Tiger Woods, you may say great golfer or golfer who needs to get his act together. If I say Lady Gaga, you might think, well, I don't know what you would think about that. But different names represent different reputations, don't they? Uh, my uh, wife told me about this last week when we were dog sitting uh, for my brother. And we have a cat too. And she told me about how my daughters had put together a pet responsibility chart so we didn't get confused about who was supposed to do what. So they listed everybody's name on there and what our jobs were. And so they listed mom. And next to mom, it said, pet the dog and cat, make him feel special. And based on mom's reputation, that job fits. 
And then next to uh, Emma and Allie's name, they say pet the dog and make him special. And then also feed the dog and the cat as well. And based on their reputation, that makes sense. And then the name Daddy came, and next to my name, it said, clean up poop. <laughs> now, how did my name get associated with that, I ask you? Don't answer that question, but it may have something to do with reputation with my family. A name represents reputation, doesn't it? It also represents character. Reputation is what others say about you. Character is actually who you are. How many parents, when you were picking out names for your kids when they were born, thought, well, I'm not going to name them that because you knew somebody named that and you didn't like them. And every time you thought of your kids, you don't want to think of them. There's character. You don't see girls named Jezebel anymore. You don't see boys named Judas anymore, do you? You just don't see that because names represent character. And that happens in the Bible too. Most of the names in the Bible represent something and they did that on purpose. One of my favorite is Jacob and Esau, the, the brothers who were born. And Esau's name means red and hairy. And they named him that because he was red and hairy even at birth. I would have loved to see that. I don't know if he was an Ewok or Gremlin or what he was, but he was red and hairy. And so they named him that and he grew up to be like this really carnal guy. And then Jacob means deceiver. And if you know the Bible, you know he grew up to be a deceptive, swindler, politician type of person in the Bible. The angels told Jesus' parents to name him Jesus, which means savior. And that says it all. Whenever God changed somebody's character, oftentimes he changed their name, wouldn't he? Abram became Abraham. Jacob became Israel as he exercised his faith. Simon became Peter, which means rock. So God says a name represents character. A name also represents authority, doesn't it? Represents authority. You know, if a policeman pulls you over and you don't notice him and he gets over the loudspeaker, he doesn't say, pull over in the name of Mickey Mouse, does he? Nobody would pull over. He says, pull over in the name of the police and you'll pull over because that has some authority. And so here's where it hits home. God says, when you misuse my name, what you're doing is you are dishonoring, you are defaming my reputation, my character, my authority when you misuse my name. Now, what does it mean, or how do we misuse God's name? What does it mean to misuse God's name? There are four things I wanna highlight, ways that God's name can be misused. Number one is using God's name profanely, using his name profanely. And this is what you think of, profanity delays, connecting with God. When, when God shared these 10 commandments with the Israelites, one of the things he was doing was he was revealing himself in a very personal way to these people. He revealed his very personal name, which is the name Yahweh. And this became so revered among the people that Jewish scribes, when they copied the Old Testament scriptures and the Jewish scriptures, many of them, when they came to write the name Yahweh or God, they would use a different color ink for that. When they went to say that, they wouldn't say certain names for God out loud out of reverence. And yet anymore, whenever somebody cuts us off in traffic or our field goal kicker misses the field goal, a lot of people have no problem using God's name as profanity or connecting his name, using it with profanity. As a matter of fact, you've probably noticed our culture is becoming more and more profane, aren't we? Using more and more profanity. Hollywood can't sell a movie without adding enough profanity for people to actually go. A G-rated movie, it doesn't sell. They have to add things so that people will actually go. Music with explicit lyrics sells more records. Comedians who use more profane words sell more DVDs. Our culture is becoming profanity-laced, and it's not just seeping in, it's increasing. But the good news is, people who follow Christ talk totally different than that. Right? Wrong. Followers of Christ, many times... Don't talk any different. You might say, well, what's the big deal with that? 
I want you to look at this scripture in Ephesians chapter five, where Paul is talking to Christ followers and he's saying, here's, since you're saved, since Jesus saved you, here's how you ought to act. He says, nor should there be obscenity, which is profanity, that's that word means, foolish talk, which is stupid talk, literally, coarse joking, and he's not forbidding humor here, he's forbidding humor that twists everything into some innuendo, or twisting something into a way to tear somebody else down, coarse joking. And then he says, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. And thanksgiving here is appreciation for God and others, and what he's saying is, if your words are full of these things, you can't show thanks, which is a mark of a Christian. And God's issue is this. He says, it's out of place, which means it's out of line with who a Christ follower should be. And what that means is that when we are identified as Christ followers and we talk a certain way, then people begin to identify Christ with how we talk, misusing God's name. So one way is profanely. A second way is using God's name flippantly, using his name flippantly. And this isn't, you know, using it with profanity necessarily or, or being foul mouth, it's just being flippant. So when you catch a 10 pound bass, you know, you say, OMG, right? And maybe you say the whole thing. And maybe some people use the, you know, abbreviation for that and think, well, I didn't just do that. But when you write DR instead of doctor, aren't you writing the same thing? It's about what it represents, isn't it? Maybe you say, Lord, I can't believe Susie's pregnant again. Or maybe, you know, whenever it's 90 degrees instead of 110, you say, praise Jesus. And in your heart, if you're really praising Jesus, that's one thing, but if we're just kind of throwing around, God says, don't do that because I'm the almighty God. I'm more than an exclamation point or some sort of catch phrase. We also flippantly is also kind of throwing his name in with frustration. Again, it's not vulgar, it's just kind of frustration. You know, OMG. I don't know why we associate God with frustration, do you? I've never heard anybody say, oh my Buddha. I mean, not yet, anyway. Maybe it's gonna start today, I don't know. Yet we use God's name that way, right? Flippantly. And when we think about misusing God's name, I don't know about you, when I grew up talking, about, when I grew up in the church and they said, don't use God's name in vain, these are the two ways that I was told not to use God's name, profanely and flippantly, right? But listen, that's not all that God means when he says don't misuse God's name. As a matter of fact, it's just scratching the surface. Really, if you get at the heart at what he means, it's the third and fourth way that we can misuse God's name. And the third way is using God's name for personal gain, personal gain. Now, when God came and gave these 10 commandments to the Israelites, remember he had rescued them from slavery from the nation of Egypt. And remember last week we talked about the idols in Egypt and how they worshiped literally everything. They worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars and they had gods that represent all these things. And what they would do when they got to a point that they wanted something personally, they would invoke the name of one of these gods, almost like rubbing the, the lamp for a genie or you know, an incantation of some sort. In the name of this, you know, I want this. And what God is saying is, I don't want you to use my name in that way. My name is special. I'm the almighty God. I'm the Lord. I don't want you using my name like the Egyptians used the name of these other gods. And one of his main concerns when it comes to that is that God's name would be misrepresented it would be connected with things that he does not endorse. Does that make sense? And there's some people that have become experts at that. You know, they'll say, you know, I heard God telling me that you ought to do this when God never said any such thing, but they're just saying that to manipulate somebody for personal gain. Or how about the dishonest TV evangelists? And not that they all are, but there are some who say, God told me that if you don't send me $1,000, we're gonna have to pull the plug on this ministry. I think God says, pull the plug. You're misusing my name. I never told you that. You're using my name to endorse something that I never said. As a parent, 
We can get into that, can't we? You know, punishment doesn't work, grounding doesn't work, threatening doesn't work. So we resort to the, now remember, God is watching you, right? How many ever used that before? You don't want to admit it, do you? How many parents ever use that? We don't mind condemning our parents, right? All right. It never worked. As a matter of fact, it's misusing God's name, if you stop and think about it, because we tried everything else first and we're just kind of just using it as a billy club and it presents this picture to our kids as if God's a cosmic cop, right? That's not who God is, is it? Maybe it's a spouse we use it, you know, looking for a new car and say, honey, I really feel like God is leading us. I've been praying that we need to buy this BMW, you know? As a husband, how am I supposed to say no to God, right? I think sometimes God's looking at, at the variety of these things saying, don't bring my name into it. I, I, didn't, I don't have anything to do with, with that. There's an example in the Old Testament when the king of Assyria, he was gonna go to war against the Israelites when Hezekiah was king. And so he threatened them. He said in Isaiah 36, 10, he said, the Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. God didn't really tell him that. And so God's true prophet, Isaiah, he called the king of Assyria's bluff and he said to Hezekiah, he said, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. And so this is not a new thing. This is something that people have done. Try to throw God's name around, put some weight behind what they're trying to do. Maybe an illustration for today is I brought this can of Dr. Pepper up here. You know, and I don't think they can zoom in this tight, but you know, right here is the initials TM. And we know that that stands for registered trademark, right? Which means this can of Dr. Pepper and everything associated with it is the sole property of the owners to be done with whatever they say needs to be done. Now, what would they say if I got a cup of plain water, Chandler water, threw some caramel coloring in there, mixed up some sugar, started bottling it, slapped the label Dr. Pepper on it, started selling it for profit. If I actually made money on that, what would they do? They would sue me. And they'd have every right to sue me because what did I do? I just took their name and I misrepresented it for something they didn't endorse and I misused it for my personal gain. Now, if you're a spiritual leader, We have to be really careful about that, don't we? Kind of throwing God's name around for things that really is something that was my idea. And it doesn't have to be, you know, insidious and terrible. It can be ever so subtle. We kind of have to be careful of that. And God says, that's exactly what you're doing when you put my name on something that I didn't explicitly say in the word. That's another way to misuse God's name for personal gain. Another way to misuse God's name, if we're drilling down to the heart of this, is using God's name to justify sin. Using God's name to justify our sin. This was the main issue that Jesus had with the religious leaders when he came. He said something to them that kind of summarized where they were. He said, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. They would use God's word to justify doing things that were sinful. And isn't that what happens though when we do things like back out of a commitment and say, I've been praying about this and this is what God is leading me to do. Even though maybe I signed a contract and I'm backing out of that early because I've prayed about it. And I'm comfortable with that. Backing out of a relationship that I've made a commitment to in a marriage and I've prayed about, yet God is leading me to do this. Using God's name to justify sin. Sometimes it can happen when we say we're gonna pray for somebody or somebody says, would you pray for this? And we dig for more information that turns into gossip so that we can pray more intelligently for that person, right? And it ends up being gossip or, hey, pray about my neighbor because, you know, they really have some marital problems and here's all the details and their son's a really bad person and, you know, so pray for them, okay? 
We just used God's name. Justify gossip, didn't we? Or how about this? Doing something that we know full well is against God's will. And doing it and saying, you know what? God will forgive me. Justifying using God's word and God's name. Listen, God's forgiveness is for people trying to get out of sin, not for people who are continuing in sin and using it as an excuse. Misusing God's name. And God says, if this is you, he says, I won't find anyone guiltless of that. In other words, he's saying, don't think this is a trite thing. Don't think this is a little thing or something that doesn't matter because it's my name, misusing God's name. Now, on the other side of things, how can we use God's name the right way? Because that's really, that's really the direction we need to head, isn't it? How can we use God's name the right way? Let me mention a couple things here. Number one, using God's name in the right way means using God's name in continual worship. Continual worship. We worship with his name. Worship is the opposite of profanity. It's the opposite of being flippant with God's name. It's the opposite of using his name for personal gain or to justify what I'm doing. It's focusing on him and worshiping him continually. You know, there's a great Psalm 29.2. It says, ascribe to the Lord. That means give. That word ascribe means give. Give to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. It means when we speak God's name, we do so with sincerity and with, we're careful and with our hearts into it in a loving way. We have that opportunity every single week. We have that opportunity every single day to continually worship him. One of the things um, I was talking to my kids about was honoring God's name uh, through honoring his word. You know, loving God's word, the, the things that he says. So this week on Monday, because they've been asking, I took them to go buy their very first Bibles. Now we have Bibles at the house. They read family Bible. They have children's story Bibles. But each of them got their own Bibles with their name on it, and they were so excited. And when we got home, I said to them, I said, hey, listen, one of the ways we honor God is by not treating this like any other book, you know, and, 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 and throwing it around and letting it get tore up like our other books or, you know, letting other books be more important than these books or putting them on the shelf, letting them gather dust. This is an important book. We honor God's name by honoring this. And they were really excited about that. And so they're reading this thing as it's adventure, adventure study Bible for kids, NIRV, has some really cool stuff in it. And so they're reading it the next day and my wife texts me and say, hey, I'm, I'm so glad that you got the girls this Bible. After reading it for the last couple hours, Emma just came in and asked, mom, what's a prostitute? <laughs> this didn't work out like we planned. <laughs> and then she asked, mom, what did it mean that Adam and Eve made love? And then my wife said, just wait till your daddy gets home and he'll explain all of it to you <laughs> at that point in time. <clears throat> continual worship. We honor God's name through continual worship. What it means, it says there that uh, glory is due his name. His name. Do you know the names of God? You may not know this, and if you don't, there are a lot of different names for God in the Bible, a lot of them, okay? And when you study those names, you learn about different aspects of his character. Now, it's one God, but like a diamond, there's all kinds of different angles that you can, you can really look at God's beauty and get to know his different names. Uh, there's going to be some come up on the screen there. One of those names, if you look in the Hebrew, is Elohim which means God, mighty creator. It's translated God in your, in your Bibles. But that name for God, you praise him for being the mighty creator. I mentioned earlier, but the name Yahweh, when you see the, the L-O-R-D in all caps in your Bibles, that's the name Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. And we, we worship him by getting intimate with him because he wants to share his nature with us. Another name is Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. 
And so we praise him for having peace in our hearts that come from Jesus Christ. We get to know different aspects of his character. One of the books I wanna recommend, we have this in our resource center. It's called uh, The Names of God. And this is 52 different names of God. You can use that as a weekly study. And you go through it and it talks about just the different aspects of God's character based on praising his name. Praising his name. Using God's name in continual worship. A second way we can use God's name the right way is using God's name to be a witness. So we worship and we witness with God's name. What do we do with God's name? We worship and we witness. Now there are a lot of different ways that we can be a witness. I wanna mention a couple specific ones based on his name, okay? One of the ways that we can be a witness with his name is by defending his name, by defending his name. That means if people around you are using God's name in such a way to bring him dishonor, that we stand up for God. You know, if you were dishonoring my wife's name and throwing it around and saying things about her, I would defend her to you. Now I'm a small guy and I'd probably get beat up, but I would try my hardest to make you sorry that you trashed my wife's name. If somebody trashed your mom's name, you would defend her name. It's one of the ways that you show love to other people by defending who they are. When God's name is misused with our families, our friends. We need to do it in such a way to show influence to people. We don't go beat them up like we would if they trashed our wife. But we need to show influence and, and do so in a way that, that it's received. But we need to defend his name. We need to talk to our kids about this. Lots of different ways that you can do it. One guy, I don't necessarily recommend this, try it if you want, but one guy I, I know of, whenever somebody uh, used Jesus Christ as a cuss word, he followed up with, loves you. So if somebody goes, Jesus Christ, he'd say, loves you. So you can try that if you want and see how it works. You may make a, an impression. But defending his name. Another way to witness is by talking about his work. Talking about his work. Or bragging on his name is another way to say that. Bragging on his name. When we talk about what God's doing in our lives, we give him credit Psalm 66.5 says, come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. So when something happens that you know is an answer to prayer, it's a great way to witness to say, you know, God, is, God has answered this prayer. God did this for us. I've been praying about this and God came through. The person might not automatically, you know, convert right there on the spot, but it plants a seed and lets them know that you're honoring God's name by being a witness about what he's doing in your life. Just a simple way to use his name rightly. The last way I wanna mention about using his name the right way, and really this is the one that makes all the rest of it work, is by relying on him completely. Relying on him completely. Now, in the Bible, over and over, it talks about call upon the name of God and he will answer. Or God says, call upon me and I'll be here. That's another way of saying relying on him completely. He wants us to rely on his name. That's how we worship him. That's how we're a witness for him, by relying upon him. And Jesus says something about using our words. And, and, and we've been talking about that in God's name, you know, how we use our words. And Jesus says something really interesting that gets us to the right place. He says in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Now there are some scary <laughs> verses in the Bible. That's one of them for me. I mean, I think back through just the stuff I can remember that I've said, much less the stuff that God's gonna bring up that I don't remember that I said. And that's a scary verse. It's the same thing that God said when he said, I'm not gonna hold anybody guiltless who misuses my name. What Jesus is saying here is words aren't just a, a small thing, a trite thing, whether you're being flippant or whether you're being vulgar or whether you're misusing, or whether you remember or not, God is our judge and he is keeping track. We will be judged. But the good news is this, guys. There is a way to bypass that judgment altogether. And it has to do with God's name. 
I want you to look at Acts 4.12, where it says, salvation, that is being free from judgment, being forgiven of all your sins, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name, and there it's talking about the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That is saved from our sin, saved from judgment, saved from misusing God's name, saved from that. In other words, Jesus came. And when he lived on this earth, he never misused God's name. He kept all of God's laws perfectly, unlike us. And yet he went to the cross and he died on the cross like a criminal as if he had broken all those in order to pay the price for you and me. And if you're here today and you've never accepted what God has done in your life through sending Jesus Christ for him dying on the sin, on the cross for our sins, that is something that Jesus offers you today, right now. So that you don't have to fear this judgment that he talks about for our words, for misusing his name. And so Jesus pays that price for us. And that's the only way, that's the only way that we can worship with his name, we can witness with his name, is by relying on the name of Jesus. And when we do that, what happens is our hearts are changed, which is really the entire key to what comes out of our mouths. Jesus says, for out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. How many of you in here ever had your mouth washed out with soap? Yeah, I did. I know when I said bad things, I got my mouth washed out with soap. You know what? Didn't work. And probably didn't work for you either. You know why? Because the problem's not our mouth. The problem is in our hearts. Like a tube of toothpaste that whatever's in there, once the pressures of this world squeeze us, whatever's inside always comes out our mouths. And so if our hearts are full of bitterness and sin and vulgarity and profanity, all these things, guess what? It's coming out. But if our hearts are full of God and our hearts are full of joy and peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ and forgiveness and being thankful for what Christ has done. If our hearts are full of that, guess what comes out? Thanksgiving, the good things. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And today, if you've never received what Christ has done for you, he offers it right now. I wanna ask you, if you're, if you're here and you understand his death for you and you understand he resurrected from the dead to give you hope for eternal life and you're ready to make that decision, I wanna invite you at the end of the service to come up and to talk to us about receiving that gift that God gives, beginning to change your heart. If you're here though and you've made that decision before and you've realized today, you know what? I've taken some steps back. I'm allowing some things into my life that are coming out of my mouth that's dishonoring God and I don't wanna be that way anymore. Today, I invite you to renew. Maybe renew for you is trashing some of that music, some of those books, some of those movies, some of those things that just fill your inside with the stuff that's coming out of your mouth. God says, I want to dwell in your hearts. Don't let that other stuff in. Maybe today you need to go home and just trash that stuff. Maybe today you just need to offer thanks and say, thank you so much for what you've done. But today, everybody here, myself included, all of us, God is calling all of us to allow him to fill our hearts so that what comes out of our mouths is thanksgiving and not that other stuff. Let's pray together.